Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello, we are back in your earbuds with another episode from Homeschool Together. So, before we begin and we get into the episode today, head down and please leave us a review. We appreciate you. Support the podcast. Thank you. And share it with a friend, if you could. Yeah. Today we are talking about going beyond. Beyond core. Chariots of fire. Chariots of fire. Yes. Angelus and his great soundtrack. This this episode was inspired by a listener who wrote in to us and was asking a couple of questions. So one of hers was, you know, have you thought about doing an episode about how to fit in subjects beyond core? You know, core is reading. You know, it's language arts, yeah. math, history, and science. And language arts encompasses reading, writing, and spelling, even, and even grammar. Even history and science are kind of like relegated low in those first. Yeah, history few and years. science are like second tier core subjects, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. um, so you know, you're you're so focused on on these these core components that how do you how do you fit in other parts? And, I mean, and so I, that was the I literally run into this issue every single day. Yeah, and I think that it's a, a subject that a lot of homeschoolers have have challenges with. So today we wanted to dive into a little bit of what are non core subjects, why are they important, and some ideas that we have for how you can make sure that you're carving out some time in your homeschool for these important subjects. And well, the first thing was when you hear non core subjects, you think those aren't even important, right? That these are not the things we should be working on. These are the non-essential things we should be working on. If they're non-core, then, you know, what? Well, well, whatever. It's extra, right? It's just like a little group. Yeah, like bonus points. Bonus points, right? It's a little cheese on my grits, right? (laughs) Right. But, you know, I think the thing to take away uh, is that these non-core does not mean (laughs) non-important. Exactly. Um, And some of these subjects are required at many colleges for admissions. Um, Things like foreign language, which is non-core, is required at many colleges. Uh, Additionally, Colleges do look favorably on these other subjects, and, and, and they have are, well, they want to see well-rounded students. You know, with our with our interview with Jeannie Faulkner, it, you know, it was she was talking all about getting into college and all these, um, you know, extracurricular things that they're stripping out. You know, the old school requirements. I remember I had to have like volunteer hours. I had to have SATs. I had to have all these things, and these are getting stripped out nowadays. And we're going to have to replace these with other things. And I'm I'm, I'm almost assuming. These non-core subjects are, are yeah. going to become more and more important to distinguish ourselves from, you know, other applicants, you know, whether it's, you know, athletics or charitable efforts or, you know, outside of the home activities that can show, you know, um, expertise and different type of you right. know, skills, different type of life skills. But I think that if we if we had homeschoolers that were just, you know, graduating from high school with yeah. just these four cups core subjects without the the rest of this, I think a lot of colleges would probably see that, that they weren't well-rounded enough. And yeah. even in the state of Washington, like we, we're not allowed to just do core. We've got to teach 11 subjects yeah, and every it year. It depends on what your state so, is requiring. I think I, we had an interview, oh, oh man, in the Wayback Machine, there was somebody in New York that had like 13, like there was almost 12 or 13 requirements. Yeah. In some so, states, there, it's very, it can be wild. It's interesting that you know, even though some states like our state requires we teach all these subjects, yeah. um, you would think, oh, okay, well then they're they're all required, they're all as important. But again, the core subjects are really the basis of all of it. I mean, you that that's the one that there's assessments about, and you know, there's not an assessment for you know, did you do enough fine arts, right? <laughs> that's yeah. not that's not what's on the assessment. No. So, I think oftentimes these can get um, you know second fiddle to those other to those other uh, subjects, which, I mean, I think is right in some ways, right? We got to learn to read. We got to learn to do math. I think, I think we run, science are so important, I think we but. run into the same prioritization issue that the public schools are running into as well. And we, we've heard that. Only so much time. They only have so much time and we only have so many years and to get the things that we absolutely need to do and, and show the mastery, you know, sometimes things are put on the cutting floor. Like, like these subjects we're going to talk about today where we've all heard the, 
you know, the, we've all seen the news reports or the new, you know, the news channel or the, the, the article in the newspaper talking about, oh, so-and-so school had to cut, you know, fine arts funding or the theater or something of that nature. And, you know, these types of extra core subjects that we would think are very enriching for certain groups of kids, you know, giving them opportunities to learn beyond just the core classes get stripped out because they don't have enough funding or they right. don't have enough time. We can, as homeschoolers, can also run into that type of trap. And I felt that little bit of that pressure myself now that I have, now I'm starting to do two kids to do education. It's taking yeah. up even more of my time where I'm starting to see that swelling. And you could be there, you know, a family of four, the, the lovely woman who walks into the dance class every Thursday with my uh, when my youngest is going to dance class and she's got six kids and I know she's a homeschooler because all those kids are, you know, some of them are middle school age and they're all walking in with their homeschool books and backpacks. I'm like, that woman's really busy. Like, I don't know if she has time to hit all these non-core classes and right. she's having to offload that and how do you do that? And so I think today's episode, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what are those non-core subjects and maybe give us some ideas on on how to approach those in a, in a in a gentle way because we do know we are strapped for time and we don't have all day to homeschool and we right. don't we don't want to be school at home either right we've, right we've we talked don't. about that and I think that you know we we can't forget about these they're really important we're going to talk about them and, and talk about some of the great skills that you get from these um, but you know this is as you say this is what the public school is stripping out this is where we have that chance to stand above and say. Yeah. You know, I'm, we're giving one-on-one -on -one instruction. You know, we're tailoring to the needs of our kids, and we're including these things that they're not getting at your local school yeah. because we have the time and we're going to place importance on it. These non-core subjects are where kids are going to, um, they're going to potentially discover new interests, lifelong hobbies, what their career might be. Depending on how you do interests. it, it could be a way for socialization and making friends. Like I know this mm -hmm. is one. This, confidence building this all kinds very of issue is what we use the parent partnership for right to leverage you know outside of core classes giving our daughter a chance to be in a you know an environment with other kids learning that same subject from somebody who's an expert in that and we use the parent partnership to help leverage that right you know and, and you may be different at home you may have a you know co-op or whatever and we're going to get into some ideas and on, on how to do these things but you know that's one of the selling points of you know how mm -hmm. we're able to do what we do and feel great about it, right? To know that, right. you know, our daughter's getting a very well-rounded, you know, Right, we can experience. take care of home, you know, mostly we, we mostly do core at home. We do do some of these extra non-core subjects well. at home, um, but a lot of it we do outsource, which works for, well for us, but yeah. we know that not every family has access to a parent partnership exactly. like we do. Yeah. So we wanted to talk about it. So, so let's get started. Um, so the first one, the, one of the big ones, one and of I, the think, big ones. I think, I think probably one if there was ever one of these non-cores that would slide into the core class, it would be this one. It's the foreign language. Right. And that's that's the one that, that, that you, there's often requirements to take in normal like public high schools. And, and, and I kind of wonder if, if, colleges need. if the colleges are still requiring the foreign language as a part of the liberal arts education. I, I, I believe I'm, University of Washington is still requiring three, three, three years, years yeah. of foreign language, not remember, just two. I remember that at, at Florida State when I was there. And I had to take, I took German, I took Spanish in high school. I should have just stuck with it. But, you know, I, I'm, it's surprising that that is still a big requirement. I think it's a good requirement. As yeah. Well. I mean, even going into engineering, I had to take yeah. a couple of semesters of foreign language in college and I had to have foreign language from high school. So uh, the thing about foreign language, you know, I think, I think everybody's kind of interested in their kid learning another language. Obviously it really broadens your horizons, but so many uh, skills inv involved in that. Right. Some things that I didn't know, I did a little bit of research and it really enhances your listening skills and your memory. And let's be honest, we all learned all of our grammar in high school you know, all the grammar information <laughs> yeah. that we never learned. Through foreign language. Through, through the foreign language. Well, hopefully language. we're going to do better than that. We're going to teach our kids grammar like in English the proper way before we get to be, you know, juniors in high school and don't know grammar. But that finally, was our education. Finally learn what an indirect object is. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it also, you know, obviously expands your awareness, the, your child's awareness to other cultures. It really boosts problem solving and critical thinking because mm -hmm. you're really trying to puzzle this out through this language. Um, improves concentration. There's an ability to multitask, right? You've got to hear yeah. what it is, take it into your brain, analyze translate it, yeah. it, analyze it, try to try to reply. So there's a lot going on there. Um, so I think foreign language is a, it's a really valuable one. If you, I think that it really helps expand horizons. One of the things yeah. that we noticed from this round the world journey was it gave our daughter real, real appreciation that there was a lot more, there was a big old world out there. And I know through 
myself learning foreign language when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I learned French and I just really fell in love with the culture and the ideas of where I could travel. It really broadened my horizons. And also, I think from my standpoint, it also opens up a lot of opportunities, um, especially mm -hmm. if your student uh, fall, falls in love with a certain area of the world um, or, you know, it, maybe in your region of the world, there's a dominant language. Like for example, our area, you know, our, the West, Western hemisphere is dominated by Spanish, right? Yeah, it's we're, a second language. Yeah, we're very strange outliers here speaking English uh, in America. And then, you know, in Canada, they have a, a French and English, um, but it's below that border. It's Spanish all the way down. Well, and, right. and, and, you know, Brazil obviously is Portuguese, but um, it's, you know, it's all Spanish and we have a lot of Spanish, you know, opportunities to speak in Spanish. We have a lot of Spanish speaking opportunities even locally. Exactly. And, you know, having another language makes you a really great hire for, yeah. you know, your career. I can tell you that in, in when, one of the big questions, especially in the tech industry, was they asked me right away when I was hired um my second company that uh, out of college, they asked me right away, do you know another language? Because yeah, I've you, been asked as well. Multiple times they've, they said, do you know another language? Because that's very valuable to them yeah. for you to be able to go on customer calls or to go mm -hmm. into certain regions that might be, you know, growth centers for them mm -hmm. and to be able to speak the language or maybe not, you know, great speaking ability, but to be able to converse and show that, you know, a, a connection to the, to the area. Uh, one of my companies I work for was Japanese and they asked me immediately, do you know Japanese or would you be willing to learn it? Yeah. 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 No, we, we actually, we have a, a partner company that does some of our, yeah. um, PCBA manufacturing down in Mexico. There's yeah. a, there's a, a location down there in Hermosillo and they were, they were looking for which one of the engineers might speak Spanish to go yeah. and help to, you know, be a liaison. Um, so I think it's really important exactly. to find a language that your kid might really like and, and look into that. So foreign language, is definitely the first one. Um, the next one would be logic. And I didn't think about this immediately as being a non-core subject. I didn't really think about logic as being a subject, I guess is, is my bigger thing. I didn't think about it as being a subject. And I, th I think that's a, that was a, just a very short sightedness on my, on my part. Cause now that I see it, I'm like, Oh yeah. Right. You're talking about problem solving skills. It's going to assist with math and science Logic, studying logic will help you learn to organize information, make connections, draw conclusions. And really, I mean, as I think we all want our kids to be able to think for themselves as adults, right? There's a yeah. lot of, you know, today, and I can't even imagine how it's going to be when our kids are adults. There's a lot of advertising and mm -hmm. messages coming into us from all different places. And that messaging is all filtered by the person giving the message. Yep. And we need to be able to like kind of parse through a lot and go, wow, is that is that real information or is that yeah. biased from this point or that point? Or I think that logic is incredibly, incredibly important. And yeah. I was interested to see that it was on this non-core list. And I thought, wow, that's something that I don't know that we've been putting intentional time with. I know we play a lot of games and a lot of logic is involved with Tons. games, but um, I wasn't intentionally thinking about it. Well, and kind of the funny thing is a lot of times people's first introduction into homeschooling is to look for alternative educations and more classical educations. And you, when you dive into the classical education, you run headfirst into the trivium and the quadrivium. And the cornerstone of the trivium is the is the cornerstone of the early years education, um, which would be grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And so logic is a is a big piece of that. So I learn the words, uh, learn how how they you know they they fit together and then how to use them, right? The, the base of the idea. Grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And I I I think logic is something that's missed as like a formal subject yeah. and formal thinking because the what goes from logic is the next step is logical fallacies that tend to be used and for be able to uh, to see them, know when people are using them. Um, you talked about bias and a lot of times that could be unconscious. A lot of people may be using sure. logical fallacies as a way to convince you to, uh, that something is, is X, Y, or Z. And, you know, this doesn't have to be in like a political sense or even, um, you know, in a, in a nefarious sense. This could just be in the way we're thinking about, you know, an engineering problem. Absolutely. Right? One of the things I think with engineering is that's wildly overlooked is the thinking process and mm -hmm. how to solve you know what is the problem and to root cause it. I see the I see a lot of parallels with medicine. Um, there's these great TikTok videos. Not that I'm on TikTok, but it's on YouTube um, of these guys getting like 60 seconds, and it's like you have to diagnose this patient, and they give you some information. And this guy's running through all these questions, and right, inside of his, inside of his head, he's running through a logic tree 
trying to, you know, say, okay, is this part of the renal system or is this part of the pulmonary system? Okay, if it's pulmonary, based on what the information you gave me, um, what is this blood type? What is this issue or what does this test look like? Okay, now it's this. Okay, this is a this type of disease, right? So he's able to run through this logic tree. Same type of thinking runs with engineers as well, mm -hmm. where they have to logic their way through these problems to find the root cause of the, of the issue. Same system, same issues are in software programming when they are running through code and i've seen this you know firsthand watching developers run through it they are logicking their way through you know a million lines of code trying right. to figure out what the root cause of this you know asynchronous crashes on the even software. outside of stem too right we yeah. have these events called kaizen events which are basically a a, a problem solving yeah. event that you get a team together for we ha we've recently had one at work with the accounting team yeah. because we were having some issues with with accounting and we, we had a couple of, you know, big pain points for, you know, getting paid on time and for you know different accounts and stuff. And we were trying to figure out how to deal with that. And they were really doing this whole logic exercise. Yeah. Even if you're not going to go into something STEM, you know, logic is so valuable in it so is. many careers. And every paper I write for my MBA right now, it's all like, do some research and then analyze it. It's always about analysis, right? And that's, yeah. and that's you thinking through the project and trying to have your, you know, having your own original thoughts about it. Yeah. And logic leads into all and, of that. And one, one more corollary with that, and we've, we've kind of heard it in the news, kind of the rise of these um, kind of pseudo AI systems, whether it's image generation or the chat GPT. Um, I've always told my friend, from day one, last three years or so, I said, you know, in the future, we're going to manage productivity by person, by how many AIs are you managing at, at a moment? And the issue of, you know, what is that AI producing for me, whether it's text, image generation, you know, some research, go and analyze these type of things. You could be a scientist and say, hey, uh, chat, go and analyze all these proteins and their effect on the body system and go mine all that information. Once you get that data back, I then want to put that information into a you know, protein folding AI that goes ahead and, and builds me a new medication, right? So understanding the logic of managing large systems and what information is coming back and how does that fit um, in a kind of a sequence and how does that make sense? I think going forward, the AIs are gonna be used in a lot of our, of our systems and our children in the next 15, 20 years, when these be become more and more sophisticated, I mean, they already are sophisticated, but they're going to get even more sophisticated. They're going to have to learn how to manage flows of information in a logical manner. And I think logic over the next 10 to 15 years from a technological standpoint, because we know technology kind of infuses into all aspects of, of society, as our children are growing up, and they're becoming more and more savvy and they're beginning to use these systems to solve problems, to learn, to, to develop new things or, you know, cultivate ideas and have those ideas then generated, you know, using these things. It's almost like you're going to have a workforce mm -hmm. and every, everyone is going to become a manager of these systems. And so understanding logic and how the things piece together and how they are utilized is going to become a really, really important piece of how people function in the world in yeah. their in their pro, in their public and their in their career um, arenas. I think is going to be super important. So I think logic, don't don't negate it. I know it can be kind of st st you know stuffy and boring, and we can do it in fun ways like you, what you said with gaming yeah. and stuff. Game board Cultivating games are great. a logical thinking, um, that critical awareness, the critical thinking skills, all of that stuff is super important. And I I, don't, I I think it would be a disservice for us to, as homeschoolers, to leave that on the cutting room floor mm -hmm. um, as we move up through the years. Now, I'm not, listen, I'm not saying do this at like kindergarten, first, second, or third grade. Absolutely, but, but there are logic workbooks for need, that age. We need to think about how our children can be more logical and use information to their benefit as opposed to, you know, people are really looking at the IIs as a negative thing. I think they're going to be a boon to productivity and they're going to be used by everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even even young children, you know, we we do a lot of logic stuff with our yeah. kids and, and we can talk all, we're going to talk about ways but just because we're on logic right now, um you know, we do a lot of like thought experiment stuff with our kids where yeah. we'll as we're teaching something we'll go, "Well, what do you think would be the next thing?" Yeah. And they there she's like, "Hmm, I don't know." And she's trying to figure out what would make sense. Okay, well, yeah. if this is this and this is this, what do you think is next? We we're always asking her to try to 
to to make the next leap and draw the next conclusion and i think yeah. that's a, that's a bunch of logic work too yeah. so um so the next one is the one that we that i usually think of when i think of non-core which is fine uh, arts yes. right this is going to be your your music your visual arts your theater. crafts yeah Yep, theater. Painting, all that type of yeah, stuff. Yeah, all that stuff. Um, so obviously we know that, you know, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of research about arts education and how great it is. But, mm -hmm. you know, just a few things, it, you know, boosts confidence and self-esteem. Yep. It helps kids with their emotional well-being. You know, to, putting to, putting your creativity or absolutely or managing your feelings through the art, whether exactly. it's performing it as an artist, you you know maybe pick a a play that you really like, or if you're a painter, you can you can express your feelings and your emotions right. through that. That's a way to for some people to articulate those emotions. Absolutely, you're getting that creativity out, and you're working you're working through and processing yeah, exactly, which is great. You know, there's lots of teamwork involved mm -hmm. depending on what kind of art you do. You know, obviously you're putting on a play, or you know, you're in an orchestra or something. You know, there's a lot of teamwork. Yep. Um, it really improves gross and fine motor skills uh, and your hand eye coordination depending on what you're doing. Um, it really enhances inventiveness. I do. These are outside the box thinkers. Yeah. Which is a really big piece of this and you know the, p the potential for your child to discover a lifelong hobby or a passion you know is high i mean how, like you know just as a working example you're you're obviously very into theater but the people who are acting on the stage their resumes may be 30 or 40 plays long and these people are a nurse or they might be an accountant or oh, right whoever, yeah that's right? not their day job it's not their day job they're just doing this for fun right it is a passion that they've had and all of these folks you know started when they were kids yep. they started in high school or whenever and got that theater bug um you know how many adults do we know that still play the instrument that they played as children right we have a friend who plays the english mm -hmm. horn that's and she has played since she was a, a child we've got several friends who play instruments like that they yep. discovered they had a real passion for something it's a great way to, to decompress a lot of the people who really have love in music um my dad is a good example mm -hmm. he will go and into his you know monastery music monastery and go play music and that's a way for him to decompress and to enjoy and relax mm -hmm. you know just to compose and, and make um you know as much as we think engineering um is you know all about building and, and rigid thinking putting together music digitally nowadays is is very much a um a, almost an engineering problem yeah. in a lot of respects same thing with like art or, or putting a play together, you have creative, you know, you're writing, you're acting, you're doing all these things and you're putting a lot of pieces together. It's not just a simple like, oh, I like to throw boomerangs, right? Or whatever it is. A lot of these things have multiple levels associated with them. It's not just a simple one action, not just like fishing, even almost any one of these activities are you know, they have many layers associated with them. Or they could. They could be as simple or as complex as people want to make yeah. them. And I, and I think that's what's great. You can you can just dabble yeah. or you can dive, you know, headlong into one of these as a passion, which I think is great. Yep. Um, and the last one's practical arts. So these are your hands-on skills. This is going to be your sewing, cooking, uh, your all your technology mm -hmm. stuff, coding, and things are going to be part of this. Uh, so anything that's practical and, and hands-on. I think there's like um, a, an achievement bug in, involved in that when yeah you know when to, we see our, to makes to create something yeah we see our Arts daughter that way too. yeah we see our daughter doing that all the time when whenever well, both of our daughters when you, you'll probably see this with your kids as well when they create something and it's amazing you know it's really good or right like last the other night just as an aside we were um, trying to kill some time because you had a meeting late at night and uh we we're put on youtube and we watched this guy draw fantasy maps and my daughter was like this is awesome and she, you know why she liked it because she goes i think i could actually do this and we shut it down, went right to the table, and we started doing it. And she had such like a sense of accomplishment, right. drawing this really cool fantasy map of mountains and lakes. And, and th that's a great, and that's a great fine arts example yeah. Yeah. for for our, our daughter. Also loves sewing, mm -hmm. and so on She'll that practical side, she's always working with sewing. And one of the things that that practical arts do is they teach you resilience because oh, you yeah. know you're you're not great at them they're skill based and so if you can make it past the learning phase of a right. little hobby like this then you have definitely ma mastered the perseverance thing absolutely yeah. so again they could discover a lifelong hobby or passion exactly this is the one where kids are going to get the opportunity or a career or right. a career they're going to get the opportunity to maybe find what they want to do with their lives as far yeah. as a career goes and that's big the guy the guy building the uh the uh, tiny home last night Oh yeah, we watched us video. YouTube Some silly video. video. I'll see if I can dig it up for you guys. He was actually kind of silly, um, but 
he it cost him 15 grand to make his little tiny house and he puts it up on youtube and what did he say he made more money in the ad revenue than it cost him to build the the you know the actual tiny house right and this is now a career for him to have a youtube channel right it's a hobby for where him he's, yeah where he's building now things and showing people right? how to do it it's yeah. so wild that you know where a hobby might take a child or mm-hmm. take take a parent who might sit in front of a microphone hopefully one day we will be able to do this full time <laughs> we'd we'll love see, to we would love to um support the podcast down below in the show notes um and you know you don't know what type of passion projects can carry people forward Absolutely. in their lives this is all that real world application these practical arts is going to be if you know if your kids are the kind and our kids definitely get this way sometimes where they just don't see the application of what they're mm-hmm. learning mm-hmm. practical arts are amazing this is where they're going to learn hands on how do they how do they work on a car or how do they yeah. how do they cook a meal or whatever this is all that practical stuff this is where they get that hands on learning and it also you know a lot of these type of activities whatever they might be whatever hobby it is you know arts language whatever can carry forward in your lives. Remember when we, we just talking to you is remember when we did the farmer's market, we, we used to do farmer's mm-hmm. markets and I had my boss once tell me, he goes, wow, Matt, you're getting a lot better in meetings, communicating, and just in general, because I, I can tend to be a little overly verbose and really? yeah, I know. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, you're getting a lot better and clearer in your presentation and you're a lot more confident in front of people and presenting material or whatever. And I said, oh, yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate the compliment. And I was driving home that day and I go, you know why? Because we've been doing this farmer's market. Yeah, you've been talking to a lot of people. Talking to people, trying to sell things to people, also just conversing with people and getting out there. And it's amazing what a hobby or some side gig or whatever activity that you might be doing can benefit you in other aspects of your life and make you more confident doing things. Theater is a great example. I can definitely see a kid who's just getting into theater all of a sudden blossoming into having a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just see the, you know, our daughters and Girl Scouts just seeing the confidence that she has had selling cookies. um, Yeah. This this It's funny when when we, uh, we first started, she wanted me to press the doorbell button. She wouldn't even press the button herself. And then after, you know, an hour, then she'd press the doorbell button, but she wants me that she would stand so close to me. I'd stand right behind her that she was actually (laughs) leaning against me. She was scared. And then after a few more hours, she would step right up onto the doormat, be right yeah. near. Then, you know, now all the way to now when we're delivering the cookies now, we come up and I'm, you know, we're carrying the wagon full of cookies. We're going She's to like, each Mom, door. You can stay back. And yeah. she was like, no, no, Mom, don't come up. Don't come up. I got the cookies. I'm like, well, but I mean, I got to at least make sure you're safe, you know, because you're only seven and yeah. you're going to these doors. And she's like, but don't let them see you. I'm doing this on my own. I know. Right? And, and, From and a just kid change, who wouldn't right? even press the doorbell herself. And that was all one day. That, that well, yeah, it was a couple of days of couple selling. Of days, right? A couple yeah. of days. So really, um, yeah. So there's there's confidence boost. But, this is off. This is also creative. There's right, critical exactly. thinking, collaboration, fine motor skills. Resilience for me is the big one with all practical yeah. arts because you really there's a lot of failure before you oh, you start to master absolutely. these skills. And so I think that that's that's really really great. And don't discount the effect across children. Like, you know, our younger daughter is watching our older daughter do these things and she's going along with her or she's watching her do her sewing or her Lego or her music or whatever it might be. Don't discount the effect that a child who's doing non-core subjects and, you know, achieving some level in it, like whether it's sports, whether it's volunteer activities, mm-hmm. whether it's some, some creative aspect, learning a language, whatever it is, don't discount the effect down the stream that that can right. cause. Like, I know we were sitting watching a movie today. And our little one was asking our daughter, our older, math questions. Right. Hey. Why seven plus four? What's seven plus four? And, you know, our daughter's a little sick right now. She's like, 11. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's like, 14. <laughs> Stop asking me math questions. Right, it's our, our older daughter sitting on the couch ho- I, holding a bucket because she's been vomiting. <laughs> and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm leaning in with my Kumon book open. Okay, next one is 346 <laughs> plus 57. Our little one just does. She keeps testing her with math facts. It's interesting you mentioned physical education. Yeah. So that's the last non-core subject is physical education. And this one... I obviously we we know the benefits of getting out there, being healthy, of our Stay kids, tuned. teamwork yeah. and um yeah. and collaboration and learning the skill, resilience and grit. And yep. there's a lot of good things with physical education. This one to me, I didn't feel like was one we needed to cover quite as much because 
you know, getting outside and doing things with our kids is something that, you know, that we're all kind of doing. We're being active and getting our yeah. kids out to play. So um, I this one to me, I think we've kind of got, you know, obviously you've got your sports leagues and things and you've got all that time running around outside you can and think playing. About it, and, like a family could be really into hiking. Like that could be your family absolutely. thing. Absolutely. You, your dad could have played basketball in semi-pro in, in, in Europe, right? And he has a love for basketball, not me. Um, he, That's like, a pretty amazing story, but okay. That would be, it would be amazing. Um, like I'll, I'll disclose, I love golf. That's one of my favorite sports right. that I ever played. I, you I'm, can share that with her. And I can share that with them and I'm going to, yeah. you know, get my oldest into playing golf this summer and see if she really likes it. If she doesn't, whatever, I'll back off and cry into my pillow at try night. Try next year. Try next year or I'll try in a, a year or two with a younger one. But, you know, whatever those things are, they may be unique to your family. You know, uh, we like bike riding. My daddy goes bike riding all the time or mommy does triathlons or um, mommy used to be a swimmer in high school and college, right? Whatever it might've been, you can share in those environments you know, with your, with your children. And, and those can be very unique to what, what your family might be mm-hmm. into. Absolutely. Daddy's a power lifter. <laughs> no, not anymore. Too many injuries. <laughs> so, so these are the, these are the main non-core subjects that we wanted to discuss. And there's more that, you know, I'm sure you could find, yeah. but these are the, the main ones that we wanted to talk about. So now we want to get into like, yeah, how do, how do I get all these things in? Yeah. I mean, there's right. a lot going on. Well, and the, I think, I think with the, you know, with some of the, how do I get it in is the fear of the, you know, the, the scaling complexity of what do I pick? You know, I think. Right. Well, the, and trying to do it all. Well, okay. Well, okay. Yeah. So I've got to pick a practical art and a fine art and I also have to do foreign language and, you know, it's a lot. So I think that the first piece of advice is, you know, um, you can't do it all. So don't, don't have FOMO. And, and we we'll, have a really great episode yeah. on homeschool FOMO that, that Matt will link in the show notes um, that we did last year. But, you know, maybe pick a couple. Yeah. you know, to, to focus on. And then you can rotate. You don't have to do them all at once. Yeah. I think that that, it would be overwhelming to say like, well, these are all good things. I want to do them all. I want my kid to be super well-rounded and I want us to have time for everything. And maybe you can have little bits of time for lots of things, but if yeah. you're going to really be intentional and focused on something, you may have to just pick a couple of areas at a time. Yeah. And yeah, I think I agree with you. Collapse down to things that either they're interested in or things that your family shares you know, interests across the, you know, or across. rotate, you know, we're yeah, going to do a foreign language oh. for a couple of months intensively. Yeah. And then we're going to, then we're going to work on music yeah. or, you know, you, you pick well, what works just, for you. Just think about yourself. Like you're always like, I'm always into new things. I'm always trying sure. to learn new stuff. There's no one thing that I learned in, in my first, you know, 18 years of life that set the path of like my entire life. I could never leave that path. You can always leave. Like I'm a stay at home dad. Now I went to school to be a physicist and learn about super small things at really high energy. And I became an engineer that built weather balloons. And then I worked in software and now I'm a stay at home dad, right? The, the idea of pivoting, you went to go school to be an ocean engineer and now right. you're a project manager, right? And they, if we're in tech, medical devices, in medical devices, right? They're like yeah, the, totally the, different. the way our lives pivot should you should you should take comfort in the fact that we have a lot of opportunity in the world and everyone can pivot into new and exciting things and our children don't have to be set to find oh they have to love tennis or they have to love this thing and it's just sitting there if i could just show it to them they'll love it because there's like 50 million things out there and i got to find the one thing there doesn't have to be the one thing right you can just say here's a to show them the fact that there's so many things you can we do. We can sample and, and sample find them, yeah. something that works. And and w- the funny thing with genetics is, Ariel, when we mixed our genetics together and, and they look beautiful children, mostly because of you, and <laughs> and hey, have all my athletic ability so far, um, they, they're, they're going to share a lot of the same things we're into because they're going to, they're a mix of our personalities and, you know, right. things and that daddy likes. they're going to things that we're totally not going to like. Exactly. Or have any like, interest in. Our daughter likes sewing. Eh, I don't get it. <laughs> Oh yeah, I like sewing. I know you like it. So and it's it's funny how like and she likes basketball. Hey, that's something I love, right? right? And it's funny how 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 they'll they'll like key in on things that we like, Absolutely. but also they'll develop things that you know both right. of us don't are not into. So when we get to we get to the the non core stuff, uh, I think that you know kind of as a as a base starting point, like what do you pick? Yeah, right? We I talked know. about sampling and stuff. What do you pick? First and foremost, 
make sure that your core stuff is going going smoothly. Like yeah. make sure you're in the groove with with your core before before you have to add on things. If it, you're having a rocky start with your math curriculum and yeah. you know you're fighting about it, it's not the right fit. You're not really well into your homeschooling groove. Don't try to add in extras. No, you know get that get that solid foundation working, and then you know you can be intentional about the extras. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, make sure your house is in order before you you move out beyond that. Right. So a couple of ideas to to fit these in. We're obviously we have busy schedules. One thing you could do to fit in non core is make a project. Make something yeah. project based. Like um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, sew a, a costume, or yeah. we're going to knit a hat, or um, we're going to have like my daughter and I decided we were doing a Harry Potter study earlier this year that we wanted to have a um, a a feast. Yeah, we wanted to have a, a welcoming feast like they had at Hogwarts, yeah. and so we got the Harry Potter book, and that's what we did. And we made a bunch of different British recipes, and we did some <laughs> research about where they came from, and that was a whole big event that was a project basically that was not core. Yeah, you and, know, and we we have a friend who's trying to make like a downspout energy generator for a, a, a friend who has a, a young boy, um, and he's trying to build an electronics uh, power generation to charge a cell phone that from when right. it was raining on his downspout and i'm like oh this is great what a great project that's outside of his normal right. curriculum and he's doing all of this great technology stuff he's got his little solar panels he's, he's out there googling um you know pieces of equipment and mm-hmm. what he needs and I'm, I'm kind of like lightly giving him yeah, some ideas him. lightly and, and i'm like okay well here do the, you know think about this think here's a here's an idea maybe go research this and that was totally his own project and that i think it's be, he's got a downspout right by his bedroom window and they live in like a, a wire and kind it. of like a split level and so yeah. he's got this this lower bedroom window there and it's right there and he was like i bet maybe i could do power generation of that i just want to charge a cell phone like yeah. this is his whole thing he's totally geeking out on it that's great so this is a project so if you're not sure what to do and you don't want to like get a curriculum or do i get a workbook or whatever yeah. maybe there's a project and you could dive into something and, and- that emphasizes an on-core subject and the thing with a project that I, I love about it it has a couple things it has an end goal so the completion of that project right and very often you can then time bound it say okay let's do this project if you have a younger kid okay it's maybe a, a single city or if you have a little bit older kid in elementary school maybe it's a week-long project or a two-week project and maybe if you have a young teenager maybe that's a semester-long project right. i mean it can vary based totally. on on their ability to manage, you know, the scale of the project. And their interest, sustain and their, their interest. interest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's a great one. The other thing you can do to emphasize non-core is to take some of your time yeah to invest it to learn with your child. One mm-hmm. of the things we've talked about, we haven't actually started with foreign language yet with our kids. Um, our daughter's only seven and we're, we're, we're keeping our house in order first. We're trying to get her yep. comfortable with reading in English before we introduce the extra foreign language. And for that could be right or wrong, but that's just the way that we're, we're, you know, going right now. Yeah. Um, but one of the things we've talked about is we would like to learn Spanish. And when we do that, we're going to learn it as a family. Yeah. We're all going to learn Spanish together. And that's a great way for us to do something non-core, support her, and also gain skills ourselves. As you said, we love to learn all the time. We're always learning new things. Yeah. And I would love to be able to speak another language i mean that would be great even lightly in conversational like just right i mean I don't and there's plenty of places yeah. that we could use them we've got plenty of different businesses in town and stuff that we could actually use use the language and get some real enjoyment practice out of it so absolutely and you know i'm just itching to go back to spain so <laughs> <laughs> we love spain we definitely want to go back so that's another idea to do it with your kids um and then the, the next idea is to outsource well, is to schedule it, right? Schedule it, yeah. And yeah, and and through outsourcing, right? So maybe it's like, okay, well, we have a piano, t- you know, teacher that comes in once a week. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a tutor for a foreign language, or um, we have an out school class, or we have our parent partnership like we do. Or um, um, that, that engineering dad in the co op is willing to, you know, educate my kids about right. something, and I'm willing to. Well, and help we have them with we theirs. have a co op day, and the co op yeah. has a section that does non core stuff, or um, there's a special enrichment class. There's all kinds of kids like painting classes and cooking classes. We have yeah. a, a local kind of uh, enrichment center that has after school classes, um, or there's a summer camp. Oh, I'm going to send my kids to music summer camp. Mm-hmm. You can just say, hey, I don't have to worry about this piece because I'm going to outsource it and I'm going to choose this. And that's kind of what we've done with our parent partnership. Our daughter takes sewing. That's great. 
Yeah. We don't have to worry about doing it here. Sure, we have to support her doing projects yeah. and, and taking the time when we talk about it and stuff. But I don't have to think about teaching her how to do that. I've outsourced that. So that's a great way if you can schedule something, mm-hmm. then you can, you know, help take some of that. The pressure. Some of that pressure off. The yeah. Perfor- and not a performance, probably a bad word for it, but there is a performative pressure in the sense that you as the educator have to be quote unquote an expert in a thing right right well and you have to you have to pick the resources right oh, yeah. even if i don't know how to do it i need to pick a curriculum for yeah. it i have to get all the supplies sometimes you know obviously there's a cost to it but uh, oftentimes there's a cost to it but you know if you can outsource and schedule it if it's on the schedule it's more likely that it's going to happen exactly um next one you could do is you can um basically set an event so work towards something like oh hey we're going to if it's a physical activity, we're going to run a 5K this summer and we got to train for it, right? right? Or maybe it's a musical recital at the end of the summer. You're going to play two songs for grandma and grandpa. Right. We have a recital set, our, our family and friends. That's what we have. A, this the same boy who who's yeah. working on the on the the uh, charger. Yeah. He's also part of some piano classes with some neighboring homeschool kids. Mm-hmm. And they have a recital set every year. Yep. And that family sets a recital date. And all the kids know that this is the date they're working on. And they send out like little invitations to... <laughs> their family and it's friends like a, to come like a to little the recital. concert yeah orchestra yeah and they do it every year and yeah. so it's something that they all have something to work towards and i think that that can be a really fun you know event to prepare for but also like with that you have those great skills like oh i have to prepare for it i have to stick to it i'm you know, there's a deliverable that I have to right. do. I mean, those are great. That's a great way to do that. Right. We have the, the, one of the locals, the state fairs is actually close to our, close to our home. And, you know, they have entries every year for mm-hmm. like things that were, you know, uh, cooking things Jams, or sewing, like the best jam of or, the year, yeah. you know, gardening or whatever. And, you know, if you are going to commit that, okay, hey, we're going to enter this thing this year, our daughter's super interested in trying out one of the farmer's markets and doing kids day yep. at the farmer's market where you can sell, ba- the kids can do baked goods and stuff and they can sell them. And she wants to raise money for, you know, maybe some Lego sets or summer yeah. camp or something. And that's like an event we can prepare for. Like, okay, we're going to register for Kids Day. Well, that means in three months, we need to be ready. You need to be ready with recipes. Well, yeah. What recipes are we going to make? And, and oh, and we have to do the calculation on those recipes and mm-hmm. how much it costs and how much, so how, what you should you press pra- them at? You got to practice. You have to practice your pitch. I mean, there's a bunch of yeah. stuff that goes with that. But, but we can basically say, I'm not going to worry about having to every week i need to do a new recipe with my kid for cooking it's like well we got this event planned so all the preparation to go to that is going to teach her a great deal about baking yeah great yeah it's a great way to kind of narrow the choices and make it a little bit and and put it in line with you know your family like you could almost say like hey we're practicing our you know you're gonna bake bread you're gonna practice baking bread once a week and you could just practice and find a recipe you like and then that's what you'll sell at that event but you know, also that's something you're doing every single week and you're mastering skills and maybe changing ingredients and stuff like that. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, great way to kind of like extend that out. Right, right. Another idea is to take your non-core and integrate it into core. Mm-hmm. So we just talked about cooking and baking and this is a great one where it's like, hey, uh, we're going to do some practical math practice and we're going to do it through mm-hmm. cooking or through baking. Today, we were practicing the cookie booth. My daughter, our daughter couldn't get to scouts because she was, uh, she had a bad fever. And so the scouts were all practicing how they were going to do their cookie booths. So she and her sister and I practiced what it was going to be like. Cutest to, darn video ever. Yeah. What it was going to be like to work at a cookie booth. We sat at the dining room table mm-hmm. and our daughter put all the Girl Scout cookies there. And our younger daughter and I would walk in. And we would inquire about the cookies and she would have to tell us and we would quiz her, which ones are gluten-free? Which ones are processed in a facility that has peanuts? What flavor is that one? What does it taste like? Which one's your favorite? We would ask her all these questions and she would have to kind of present. And then we were, well, the, the, the core part of this is we were giving her, we were buying different amounts of cookies and we were giving her different bills and she had to make change. It's literally the thing we're doing in math, uh, right start math right, right now. Right, Yes, I was talking to you before we started and you're like, have her make change, have her make, have change. make change. I won't do that lesson on Monday. Yeah, so <laughs> that's all we did. We just played cookie booth over and over again yeah. where we bought different amounts of cookies and we had her make change for different bills. Did she have her abacus out? I told and her. She, she had yes. her right start math abacus and she used her abacus to help her figure out how to make change so that was great we were doing something that we're working on right now in math 
but she got the skills of um, some public speaking skills out of it, you know, and so, and we did a little bit of role playing. So there mm-hmm. was a bit of drama there because then her sister got to play Cookie Booth and she got to play customer. Oh yeah, so it went pear, so, sh- it went pear shape pretty quick. Yeah, but this was a really fun event. So there's all kinds of ways that you can take something that you want to mm-hmm. do and it's like, how can I squeeze some core into this? Our, our, our Harry Potter unit study was a great example of that where our daughter wanted to read Harry Potter and I pulled a bunch of books and we did a big study about mythology Mm -hmm. through harry potter um and i'm trying to put that together for y'all and i'll get to it someday i promise (laughs) but but anyways point being i took something that she really enjoyed and we put a we put the the core into it so that's another great way to do non-core subjects um next way is maybe you could take the unschooling approach to non-core and say okay well what are they interested in and how can i you know incorporate all these various non-core subjects into the the fact that they're really interested in building a charger that from our downspout or you know your daughter's you know i want to get me in the that that play this summer how can i prepare for that i'm like okay great or sell cookies well what cookies are those i don't know why don't you read the cookie on the the cookie name on the front of the box oh samoas yes that was part of our core today too she was having to read the cookies it was really great very funny so yeah i think that's really great we take we take basically uh we, we take mostly a curriculum approach to everything but Maybe you unschool for non-core, and we 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 actually talked to one unschooler, and his mm-hmm. kid wanted to learn Japanese, and that yeah. was the thing. And what he a was, great way to do that! Yeah, yeah, he was he was pursuing that on his own. Um, another idea is to use your morning time to add in non-core. We do a lot of this. We've for, done the, yeah, we have done this, and we do do a lot of this. We do this with workbooks and yeah, things, specifically and we, the Evan Moore books, and I'll link those into the show notes as well. Right. So we we take those workbooks and this is a great way to do smatterings of non-core in the Mm -hmm. mornings and you get a little bit of that in and it helps give your kid a warm up too. So that works out really great. Next you could do is take field trips. You can incorporate that into if you have like uh, as a homeschooling family, you want to do regular field trips and you can easily go ahead and incorporate that into the arts. So you can travel to various, you know, art uh, galleries around the area totally. you know if you if you have a big art scene in your in your area or if you have like a big theater scene like we have a lot of little theaters a lot of community theaters that could be your thing uh, mm-hmm. to kind of travel around and go do those you could just incorporate them into field trips and you know what type of learning can right. you learn from that or and again you're scheduling something yeah. which helps keep it you yep. know keep it something that fits into your routine and that's achievable as well right um, so the, the, the last note we wanted to make was you could take a normal part of your day and leverage it for non-core. Yep. We talked to one family and I don't remember, uh, forgive me, I don't remember which homeschooling journey it was, but we talked with a family that has Spanish lunchtime. Yep. So every day they, you got to eat lunch, right? That's a part of your day, but they only do it in Spanish. The kids all have to talk through lunch in Spanish, ask for different food items in Spanish, and that's how they practice their Spanish every day. So Mm -hmm. you could take some other part of your day. What if it's the commute? Maybe you have to commute back and forth to your Mm co-op a couple of times a week. Maybe you use that commute time to be listening to foreign language tape or um, listening to a podcast all about sewing or Mm -hmm. whatever it is, right? You know, you could take advantage of time that you would otherwise be I mean, you have you have to do something with anyways and leverage it for an encore. Well, that's kind of what we do. We do with the quiet time. Um, a lot of our right. that time is we stack a lot of different activities. Um, first one is the audiobooks. She listens to a lot of audiobooks. And, you know, from that, I get knock on effects with her reading and her language art skills. A lot of times she does art while she listens to those audiobooks. Audiobooks and, and her vocabulary explodes. And she's, yeah, she's doing art. Sometimes I have her do um, some of her side activities like hey today i want you to do 20 minutes of sewing i want you to do that at the beginning of of your quiet time so you can get that activity done and because i know you have a deliverable Mm -hmm. on friday for your teacher or she wants you to do something or learn a skill why don't you go ahead and practice that today i used to have her do her basketball dribbling in the garage Mm -hmm. during that time what's great is she has the wireless headphones so she can go ahead and continue to listen to her audiobook while she is doing the activity she also loves to do Lego, so there's a lot of engineering and building involved in that. A lot of creativity. Lot sometimes of creativity. she's just sketching. Sometimes, yeah. Or yeah, sometimes I'll... she's just playing a game and like a little like a little game where she's drawing on her iPad on the iPad. It's you know, there's a lot of different things they could do. You know, and right. that's how we leverage. So I love you know every day. I know that she's got that time to herself, and so I can always leverage additional things 
um, that are non-core in that activity, but also, you know, maybe sometimes I get some core stuff in there as well. Right. Absolutely. So those are some ideas that we had. Um, mm-hmm. You know, your mileage may vary. Figure out what your kids are interested in or what you want to, you know, maybe you've got a, a child who's a bit shy. So you're like, hey, we're going to put on a, a play about this mm-hmm. thing from history we learned because, you know, you know that your kiddos a bit needs to come out of their shell a little bit or, mm-hmm. you know, figure out what's going to work for your family and what your goals are. Pick a couple of things to focus on and find a way to fit these into your day. So the last thing I just wanted to leave you with is, you know, that whatever you decide to incorporate, be intentional with it. Really think about, you know, not just a smattering, but, oh, I, I, I really think this would be really great. My kid has a real interest in this. How can I intentionally add this in? Maybe it is a field trip or maybe it is an event or a project or whatever, but do be intentional about non-core because they are important. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you know, you want to do more than dabble. So Absolutely. hopefully this was helpful and we'd love to hear your ideas as always, you know, post on the Facebook group. If there's anything that mm-hmm. you think is a really great way to fit in those non-core subjects, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. We, we've been trying to end the podcast on what we're reading, but we're going to expand that out. Give us a little bit more opportunity because we are starting to read longer books and so we, we yes. can't we can't get books as often she's as not we're churning doing through them quite as quickly so now. we're going to change it to <laughs> what are we consuming so ariel yes. what is the sparkle pants what show gave me the sparkle pants <laughs>, laughs today our kids were all over it it's a it's a pretty new show i think yeah, by fair. pbs kids it's called work it out wombats um it's a preschool show but i have to say our seven-year-old loves it yeah. so uh, both of our kids our seven-year-old and our three and a half year old Uh, love this show. It's on PBS Kids. And the whole point of it is these uh, three wombat kids are working out problems amongst themselves. So there's going to be something like today, I was watching one with them where they couldn't figure out how to take me time. And Mm -hmm. they were fighting and the kids were fighting and they had to work it all out together. And this is such a critical thing because our kids fight a lot, and <laughs> right? I mean, just they fight as much as all children. Right. Fight, I mean, yeah. yeah. Not. I'm sure it's no more than other kids normally fight. But at least I hope so. Giving them <laughs> these skills to like work it out without us having to mediate all the time all the is time. a really big and important thing. So this has been a helpful show so far. They we've only been watching it for a few days, but mm-hmm. so far I really like what I've seen. Uh, PBS Kids does have a free app that you can get. We have a Roku, and it's mm-hmm. a it's a free app. Um, and there's a collection of episodes episodes available all the time. So uh, def- definitely check that out. Work it out wombats on PBS kids. Thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey. Please engage with us on social media. Join our homeschool together podcast group on Facebook and find us at homeschool together podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling.